Hi guys, so in this week's video I want to go over like a little checklist of best practices for landscape photography beginners. There will definitely also be some very important nuggets for the advanced photographers in there. So I have been doing landscape photography for a little bit more than a decade by now and there is a whole list of things that I have learned best practices that are just best to get implemented as fast as possible in your workflow, in your career or in your hobby. So let's get to it. So first and foremost, you want to have a proper file structure on your hard disk. I know this sounds boring, but trust me, you will beat yourself in the head in a year or two years if you don't have a proper file structure. So how I do it is that I have my hard disk, of course, and then I have a pictures folder. In that folder, I have subfolders, 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 subfolders. So the first subfolder is simply the date, year, month, date, and then afterwards I write some kind of keyword where I was, where were the photos taken or something like that. If you're only taking photos, you can just put your photos in that and call it a day. Now I, as a YouTuber, video maker, content creator with several cameras and so forth, I need to have several subfolders. So I have a picture folder, I have a video folder and I have a sound folder. And within those folders, I have subfolders from my different camera models, video camera models. And no, I don't bother with several sound systems. The important part is simply that you structure your images so you know where they are, so you can find them in 10 years time. So the next best practice is simply just to back up your files have several versions of your files. One hard disk is simply just not enough. These days, external hard drives have become fairly cheap. So what I did to begin with was to have all my photos on the computer and then I have a backup external hard drive. Obviously, as I couldn't pull more photos into my computer, that hard disk filled up. I needed to have two sets of external hard drives with the backup files. I would highly recommend to do that. If you drop one hard disk, chances are all your files will be gone forever. I would also recommend to have either two backup hard disks or at least one backup hard disk and then all your photos in the cloud. Find some kind of cloud service. I used the Norwegian Yotta Cloud for many years, but they had an upper limit of 20 terabyte. Right now I'm using a NAS system. I already have a video about a NAS on my channel. You can check that one out if that is of interest. The point being, make sure to back up your files so you won't lose anything whenever you're clumsy and drop your hard disks. So the next best practice on the checklist is to set up your camera properly. One thing I would highly recommend to do is to remove all beeping sounds from your camera. It is so annoying to listen to, especially for the rest of us when we're out photographing. <laughs> so be sure to set up your camera, simply just go into your menus, set it up. Be sure to use the favorites menu to your benefit. Obviously, if you're a new photographer, you don't exactly know what you want to put into your favorites. Over time, you kind of develop that relationship with your camera and how they work. But be sure to set up everything that you use the most from the camera in the favorites menu. So as of creating this video, I have actually just returned from Canary Photo Week, which was a great conference with loads of outdoor on location workshops in Lanzarote. And we also had like presentations and talks from me and Thomas Heaton, Kilian Schönberger, Isabel Tabacci, and a whole host of Spanish landscape photographers too throughout the week. And we did a lot of photo critique. And one of the common critiques that I found to give to all these different landscape photographers when they submitted their photos was to make sure that you have a proper balance in your photo, distribute the elements in your photo properly on either side of the middle so it doesn't feel as if a photo falls to one side or the other. It's all about visual attention. Another thing was that people weren't doing a whole lot of edge patrol, so there were a lot of different clutter and stuff along the edges that were high contrast elements that just attracted a lot of attention. You can either clone it out in Photoshop or you can crop your photo a little bit to get rid of those dirty edges. If you want to learn more about composition in landscape photography, be sure to get my two ebooks. They're easy to read. I cover 
all the basics. There are two light versions that you can try out first if you're in doubt about whether you want them or not and see what it is. There are links down in the description for these ebooks. The fourth thing that you probably won't be able to avoid is that the landscape photography community is full of quite a lot of insecure people. There's a lot of complaining from time to time. Generally, people are really, really nice. Like when I meet people out in the field, they're always super nice. But on social media, people can come off as a little bit of a, I don't know, complaining. My best advice is just to stay out of all those complaining discussions. Don't complain on social media. Complaining often comes from someone feeling that there's something unfair. The world is unfair, just deal with it. <laughs> so the best practice is simply just to stay out of trouble. Don't engage with people who attack you on social media. Social medias are designed for you to be able to block them. And don't spew out your insecurities. Find a couple of landscape photography friends where you can bitch about stuff with those people instead. Doing it in public, nobody wins from that. And especially refrain from attacking other landscape photographers online. It's just a no-go. Figure those things out privately or through a lawyer if that's what you need to do. Just don't go public with stuff like that. And don't complain about a certain thing or a certain fad that you see online. There was a Twitter fight some weeks ago where a photographer said out loud that putting your own photos on your wall is weird. Well, I guess I'm weird then. <laughs> it's a very common practice. So be careful of generalizations and be careful of how People perceive what it is that you're typing on Twitter. So another best practice is to get gear that fits your needs. For the most part, us landscape photographers, we do a whole lot of hiking. It is probably better to have a small camera and fewer lenses and a small tripod if you're hiking up onto the top of a mountain. I've said it a few times on this channel, but look at this tripod right here. This here is probably the biggest one from Benro. It's a great tripod, but it's massive. I would really hate carrying that one up to the top of a mountain. And each time I make a video about gear, there's always just like that one comment where you stop up and think like, what? So the other day I actually got a comment where a person, it sounded seriously, meant that landscape photographers can only take landscape photos with medium format cameras. Like, evidently not. Have you looked at my portfolio? Be pragmatic about landscape photography. Do what works for you. Like, don't listen to all those middle management photographers who have learned to take photos in one specific way and thinks that's the only way to do landscape photography. We are all different. And generally, don't fall for the hysteria about, like, the best specs for a specific camera. There's so much more than the specs of a camera. You also want to consider the size. You want to consider whether you need a flip out screen or not. Like right now, I'm using a flip out screen to look at that when I talk to you guys. But is it relevant for you as a photographer or is it only videographers who actually need that? So another thing I've seen over the years that there's articles popping up from time to time. And it's all about how to create a style, create a certain look. My best advice is to don't chase a style. If you just do what you want to do, over time, a style will develop by itself. If you're forcing a style onto your photos, let's say you are the guy who's always adding a blue filter or blue tone to all his photos, then suddenly you will get caught in that style and you may actually risk of burning out. And that is obviously not what we want. So just let it develop organically. Try a whole lot of different things. And if there's stuff that you don't enjoy, then don't do that and do what you enjoy instead. And slowly a style will develop. 
And speaking of this, I would actually highly recommend that you watch my video where I show all my old bad photos and see how I have developed over the years. It's probably quite enlightening. So the next thing on the list is to learn from the right people and be very careful of confirmation bias. This of course applies to all aspects of life, but it's also a thing in landscape photography. So obviously you're on YouTube, you watch a whole lot of different gear videos, some talk about megapixels, some talk about something else, and you kind of get caught into what interests you. And then suddenly you find yourself in a bubble where you seek out information that just confirms what the other YouTuber just said. And it's not always a super good way. Be sure to watch a lot of different inputs, but also be sure to, again, I come back to this very pragmatic way, figure out what works for you, but also accept that there are other ways to do things as a landscape photographer. What I can say is that it's a really, really good idea to build up like a close circle of friends that you respect for the landscape photography, either grow together or make sure that they are trustworthy in regard to giving honest feedback to your photos. It's a really good way to learn the craft very, very fast. And another way to sort through all the many different landscape photography YouTube creators and educators is simply just to go to our home pages, look through our portfolios and see first and foremost, do we know what we are talking about? And secondly, is it a style? I've just talked about style, but is it the kind of photos that you like and that you want to learn how to do? It's simply the best way. Check out the photographer's work. And speaking about not complaining and best practices, when it comes to landscape photography, there are a lot of different philosophies. A lot of different photographers have many different opinions. Also about, let's say, something as basic as editing. I consider editing a must for landscape photography because when you shoot a raw file, then you have to edit it the photo was never considered to be the final product from the manufacturers of your camera. The files are deliberately made more flat, more boring, so you can add your perspective to it in Photoshop or Lightroom or Lumina Neo or some other editing software. The point being here is that you have to edit your photos, no matter if you want them to look like reality, which is completely fair game, or if you want to go in a more artistic way like black and white photography or add more saturation or whatever to your photos. But just remember that there's no right path for a landscape photographer. We figure it out over time. And obviously, if you want to learn more about editing, I have a big post-processing course called Photoshop for Landscape Photographers. If you're using Lightroom, you can also use Lightroom and then jump into Photoshop later. I have made sure to cover everything. So everybody, whether they're beginner or advanced, should be able to learn something new. I cover all my techniques, everything from the beginner stuff all the way to the advanced stuff. There's a coupon code down description of the video that you can apply when you enroll to save a little bit of money. So the next thing on the list is if you feel a lack of inspiration because you cannot travel to the big epic vistas that Iceland or Western US can provide, but you are stuck in Germany or Denmark or Sweden or some other country where you're not super inspired, at the very least, I have found, seek out dynamic landscapes. Landscapes with hills, small valleys, streams, open areas, but with clusters of trees chances are you as a landscape photographer can easily go and take really great photos in less than optimal landscapes or less than epic landscapes. Seek them out at the right time of day, the golden hour, seek them out when there's a lot of atmosphere, fog, heavy rain, snow, so forth, and you will probably be surprised by how much your local landscapes can provide. Now the last best practice on this list for beginner photographers and one of the best ways I have found to learn landscape photography is to watch image critique videos. I watched a ton of Scott Kelby's The Grid show where people could submit photos and then he along with a guest would give some feedback on these photos. 
It simply just teaches you how to see all the small mistakes, all the different things that attract attention or pulls attention away from what you actually wanted to show with this specific photo. I've made a little playlist that you can watch here in the end. So if you enjoyed this video, I would highly appreciate a like. Be sure to get my post-processing course if you want to learn more about editing and my ebooks if you want to learn more about composition. There are links to everything down in the description and be sure to watch a whole lot of image critique videos. Here's the link for the playlist.